so first of all, I'd like to know how many of you have job-related experience with the IoT. <laughs> Barely anyone, okay. And experience with uh, IoT devices in general, like household appliances and other stuff, yeah, so quite a lot. Uh, those are probably mostly like something like uh, vacuum cleaners, smart switches, and uh, the other devices. But I guess barely anyone has experience with the smart crib. Uh, this is not a coincidence. It is uh, quite a new product. It, it dates back to 2016. It is uh, invented by an American pediatrician, Dr. Harvey Karp. Its main purpose is to calm the baby, to help the baby sleep better, and with this to help the parents sleep the better. Uh, the device is equipped with uh, three microphones and a speaker. Uh, with these microphones, the device uh, records the baby's crying, and based on this, it will uh, change it, uh, its mode. So in the basic mode, the, the sound is very quiet, and the movement inside, which you can see later, is uh, very slow. But as soon the baby starts crying, the sound will go up, and also the movement will uh, become, let's say, faster. There are uh, four, different le four different levels based on the, on the crying of the baby. And uh, it has some time out. After five minutes, if the baby has not come down, it will alert the parents to, to pick the baby up. Uh, on the user's perspective, there is a mobile application, which you can see on the left side. Uh, the users can control the snoo, which is not a usual use case, but sometimes maybe you can uh, use it to put the manual commands to put the level up or level down. Uh, but what is more useful in this application is to track the, the sleep patterns of the baby. You can go back to any date and to see how the baby was sleeping. You can also manually insert some sleep sessions if the baby at that time was sleeping outside of the uh, crib. Uh, so our topic today will be our intention is not to sell the product or to delve into the low-level details, but uh, to show in high-level manner how do we use the Internet of Things to connect the device with the end users and also to the, our backbone, where we collect the data to make some conclusion regarding the, the sleep patterns. Uh, recently, the device has acquired the FDA approval from Food and Drug Administration in America, so it is a uh, first official uh, clinical device for babies, for like a crib for babies. Uh, at the moment, it is not present in our marketplace. It is present in uh, EU and US. US is the, the biggest marketplace for this device. And uh, besides buying it, uh, people can also rent it uh, on a monthly basis because basically this uh, device is intended for babies that are younger than six months. After that, they uh, move to the normal crib. So at the, on the agenda today, beside the, the bassinet, which we had uh, explained in its basics, uh, we will talk about the Internet of Things, uh, like the general concept of the Internet of Things and how we use it. Uh, we will talk about the provisioning. It is a very important topic uh, because the provisioning is actually the way we pair the, the device with our mobile phone. And in the end, we will talk about the communication. How does this device communicate both with uh, the mobile phones and with uh, our backend? So first of all, uh, the IoT, Internet of Things, uh, basically it is a concept of a collective network of connected devices. Uh, those devices uh, mostly communicate between themselves. In our case, uh, we do not have this need, but uh, some of the examples are, for example, smart cars, which should connect between themselves. Uh, 
uh, also they co co communicate with the cloud and some of the key features of the Internet of Things are uh, security, which is very important. Uh, you do not want anybody uh, to, to hack your crib or any other device. Um, so another thing is connectivity. We have to take care that the connection is always uh, stable. Then scalability, this means that uh, at any time it should be easy to add more sensors uh, and uh, more devices to the system. Uh, then the real-time data processing, in our case, that is uh, that we uh, record the crying and based on this we make some decisions. Energy efficiency may be not so important for the crib, but most of the devices work with the battery and uh, uh, this means that the, the device should be as less uh, power consuming as possible. And interoperability, this means that uh, it should be possible to connect them between themselves. Uh, the IoT consists of uh, three main components. Uh, those are uh, the smart devices, the crib in our case, the IoT software programs. This is actually the backbone that is behind the, the IoT device and the graphical user interface. Uh, Usually that is the, the uh, mobile phone application. So we will now see the core architecture, which is um, usual for most of the IoT systems, but uh, this is uh, the exact architecture that we use. In the middle of everything uh, is the cloud. Uh, for the cloud, normally companies which produce IoT devices use some external provider because uh, the cloud um, has to have a lot of computing power, a lot of storage and uh, barely any smaller company uses its own solution, but uh, you can use some other external like uh, Microsoft or in our case uh, Amazon AWS IoT. On the other side, we have the devices which are connected to the, to the cloud. It is a two-way street, so the communication goes in both directions. Uh, we have the end users. Each end user has a smartphone, and uh, with this smartphone, we connect to the cloud. The idea is that everything goes to the cloud. There is no direct communication with the SNU. This is uh, like uh, additional security level with this. We uh, are safe and uh, sure that our snooze only go through our network, through our cloud, and uh, we can uh, maybe stop some possibilities for hacking. Uh, but there is one point where the mobile phone should connect directly to the snooze, and maybe someone has some idea when, when do we need this, when do we need to connect directly to the snoo. Yeah, so it might be one use case, yeah, but in our case, uh, something similar. Uh, because the first case is you take the snoo, you buy it, you go home, unbox it, you take the phone, and the first thing you want is to connect the snoo to your router. Uh, when you want to do this, your mobile phone needs to connect to the snoo in this moment via Bluetooth in our example. It can be in an, an other protocols, but we use Bluetooth. So uh, the only moment we need direct connection is uh, when we do the pairing with the mobile phone. We will explain later the whole process of pairing. Uh, another part of the system is backend. Uh, normally backend and cloud are actually one entity, but here we like to show it separately so that it's uh, much clearer much clearer what happens in the, in the background. Uh, smartphone connects to the backend and communicates and also backend uh, communicates with the cloud, with external provider. So the next topic is provisioning. As we said, this is a very important part because uh, not only that it has to be maximally secure, uh, 
uh, because at this point in time the device is very vulnerable. Someone can uh, intercept the network and maybe provision instead of us. Another thing is that this is the first uh, experience the user has with his device. So uh, when he buys the crypt, the first he thing he needs to do is to take his phone and connect to the to device. So, uh, before we show how does the provisioning work in uh, our backend, uh, we have some prerequisites. The manufacturer, the factory where the device is provision, produced, has to create some uh, things in advance. Uh, the first thing is to generate a one-time certificate. Uh, certificate is a way we authenticate the device and uh, manufacturer will in advance produce one certificate and it will attach it to the uh, AWS IoT or will send to us so that we can attach it to the IOC, IoT. Every time the manufacturer produces the SNU, uh, they will generate specific certificate for this device. And uh, the thing here is that this certificate has the same signature as the uh, CA certificate, the original certificate they, they have made. And this certificate should be stored on the device itself. Later we will see why. After that, uh, they should register uh, each device in our database. So this is what they repeat for uh, each produced device. So now we can see how we manage the provisioning. Here we see the wall overview, and we can zoom in to the first part. We have uh, five entities, end user, SNU, backend, database, and the IoT. Uh, all the backend and database are actually one thing, but we wanted to separate to make it uh, clear. The first step in the provisioning process is that, uh, like we said, the user uh, connects directly to the SNU. Uh, actually, the user opens up the app and uh, he can scan for available SNUs. Uh, this is done through the Bluetooth and the mobile phone will pick up the, some identifier, in our case, the serial number from the device. After that, uh, the mobile phone will send through the REST API uh, the provisioning request to our backend. It will send it along with the serial number of the SNU. We verify this request and then store it in the database. Uh, five minutes is the deadline for the request. That means that in the time frame of five minutes, uh, provisioning should be done. If this doesn't happen, for example, maybe there is some error or connectivity issues, uh, the user or the mobile phone will need to start the provisioning process again. This also means that uh, during this time, uh, nobody else will be able to provision the same device at the same time. This is identified by the serial number that is sent to us. After this, we respond to uh, backend response to the uh, mobile phone with IoT parameters. So what are IoT parameters? We need uh, to have endpoint. Like we said at the beginning, um, in the end, mobile phone will connect directly to the AWS IoT. So we need to give the endpoint where to connect. We need to send the region and we need to send thing name. Just a short explanation, what is a thing in our IoT world? Uh, so basically, each physical device has its virtual representation in our backend. This virtual representation is called thing. So this exact crib has its uh, thing in the IoT. We generated the thing name uh, by using some, by using the specific identifier for the crib, serial number, and some other things. And we need to send this uh, back to the uh, mobile phone. This data is then transferred to the crib. And uh, the crib will use this data to try to connect to our network for the first time. Uh, 
when it tries to connect, first uh, attempt will fail because there is a lot of uh, work to be done still. But what will happen is that the IoT will recognize the certificate that is on the, on the crib. We have mentioned previously that the manufacturer will attach the certificate on the crib and it will be with the same signature that was attached to the original certificate, to the main certificate. IoT uh, Backbone recognizes this by the signature and when this happens, with this event, we will trigger some function. Uh, this function is called Lambda in AWS, but we can just simplify it as some simple function. Uh, what we do when this is triggered on the backend side, uh, for the backend, this signals that uh, the crib has tried to connect for the first time. So what we need to do is to take the certificate from the AWS IoT and we will extract the serial number of the crib that is trying to connect. We need to read the device data in the database. Uh, so, again, going back to the previous slides, when the manufacturer produces NU, he also puts this data for the concrete device. Based on the serial number that we got from the certificate, we can read the device from the database and we can do some verification. We can check whether the device exists, uh, whether the provisioning request already exists. If it does, we will deny the user and whether the device was not already provisioned. If it was, we will also deny the attempt to provision. If the verification goes through, the next step is uh, the work that we have to done in the IoT backbone. Uh, we will create a thing and we will attach the certificate. Why is this important? Uh, because this certificate gives some uh, privilege to the crib. It gives some policies to the crib so that the crib can access some of the resources that we use in the IoT. For example, if we do not have this policy attached, the crib won't be able to do some operations. The next step is just to bind this device to the concrete user that has made the provisioning so that when the user, for example, logs in on another device uh, with his account, he will have his crib there. We activate the certificate. This is uh, the critical step because in the meantime, if you can remember, the first, first step that triggered everything was that the SNU was trying to connect to the IoT. It has failed and in the background it will repeatedly try to connect and it will only succeed when the, this certificate is activated and when all those steps go through. After that, the provisioning is su successful and we can use the device. So, after the provisioning is done, we need to see how does the crib communicate with our network, how does the crib communicate with uh, our smartphone. There are various ways to make uh, communication in the IoT world, and the most common one is uh, MQTT protocol. Uh, the MQTT protocol is a lightweight and widely adopted messaging protocol. It is identified by the client ID and uh, it is maybe the simplest way to explain it by drawing some parallel with the HTTP protocol. They are both application layer protocols and the difference is that, for example, HTTP is based on the request response concept on the other side, MQTT is based on the publish-subscribe uh, concept. This means that uh, plenty entities can subscribe to some, let's say, topic, and some of the other entities can publish some message to the same topic, so that only those which are subscribed to this topic will receive those messages. We will see this better in some examples. 
So here we see again our architecture and uh, we can see some examples of the MQTT communication. Uh, let's say that uh, the user holds his smartphone and he wants to manually level up the crib. In the background, a message is sent to the specific topic. This topic is uh, on our side in the format thing name, which will identify the crib, slash app name. In this case, app name will be uh, level up and control. This is the event name. When the message is sent to this topic, only one crib out of all, let's say we have thousands of cribs in the, in the field, only one is subscribed to this exact topic, which has the identifier, the same identifier that this crib has. So this goes through our cloud and only uh, one crib will receive this message. On the other side, let's say we have another example the user has some problem with the crib. He calls the customer care and uh, customer care agent sees maybe that the firmware on the crib is outdated. So he wants to, uh, to force the update of the firmware so that he can solve the problem the, cu the customer has. When he does this on some, let's say he has some portal where he can manually do this, we send the message directly from our backend on the topic SNU ID, firmware update control, and in the body of the message, we, for example, we send the version of this firmware. Like we said, only the devices which are subscribed to this topic will receive this message. This is only one device. And it, when it gets this command, then it is uh, on the device to start the firmware update, to download the firmware update, which also later goes through the MQTT protocol and to install it. So as this is a two-way communication, we can see example where the SNU sends something. Uh, for example, when I open the application, uh, immediately I see the level. If the baby is calm, I will see that uh, message baby is calm. How does this work? Uh, SNU actually sends level, baseline. This can be baseline level one, level two, level three. And it sends it to the topic SNU ID state level. We will receive this message on the cloud. Based on this SNU ID, we can recognize the user, and we can recognize the smartphones where this user is logged in so that we can send this status to the mobile phone. This is just an example how we specificate the communication in both directions from backend to SNU and from SNU to backend. We have two tables where uh, the topic is described, command, uh, maybe some other information and, and the description of uh, those commands. Uh, another way to utilize the MQTT is to set up IoT rules. Later we will see the example, but basically IoT rules is a way to set up some uh, trigger. Let's say uh, you can choose some topic and you can set a trigger on this topic. This means that when any message uh, goes to this topic, something can happen. We can set up in our AWS environment uh, what functions will be triggered here. There can be plenty. Uh, those functions are an AWS specific, so we will not go deep into them. Uh, later, we will see how we utilize this. And another way of communication is using uh, shadow. So each device, each thing in our backend uh, has a shadow. By default, when you create a thing, uh, AWS will 
a touch unnamed shadow to it. Shadow is some state of the device. It can be anything we want it to be. We can write any information to the shadow. Why is shadow uh, important for us comparing to the MQTT? Uh, mostly because uh, when the device goes uh, offline, anything we write to the shadow, it will stay there so that when the device goes online, it can read from the shadow. In the case of MQTT, uh, when the device is offline, it can miss those messages. Some important things, like uh, maybe we want to schedule some new firmware is out, we want to schedule the uh, installation of this firmware, we can push this information to the shadow. It doesn't matter if the device is offline. When it goes online, it can read uh, that there is new firmware and it can start updating the, the software on its side. It is a general IoT concept. It is not uh, exclusively related to AWS IoT. And uh, like we said, each thing has one unnamed shadow and it can have zero or many named shadows. Named shadows uh, are used by us to identify the type of shadow. We can, for example, of the firmware, we can ha have a shadow that is called firmware. Uh, how do we access? The shadow, we can use three protocols. We can use MQTT, HTTP, or SDK. So normally from the backend side, we use SDK, but uh, the, the crib itself uses the MQTT because it is a lightweight protocol. And also how is, uh, how is shadow actually stored? It is like a simple JSON document that consists of three parts. Uh, those are desired state, reported state, and delta state. For example, uh, we send the firmware version to the desired state. The crib is offline. Uh, the reported state of the firmware will be some older version that is actual on the crib because it has still not started updating. When the crib finishes the update of the firmware, it will uh, write the version to the reported state, and we will see that uh, the desired and reported state are now equal, which means that the firmware has gone through. Uh, also, we have another uh, document that is delta. It is just a difference between those two. So we can see some example of the shadow and how the, uh, how the path of the shadow looks like. It goes with AWS things. Then the SNU identifier. This is, like we said, related to the serial number, for example. Shadow name. Those parts that are black, those are uh, predefined by the AWS. And in the end, we have the named shadow. We mentioned firmware previously, but let's say we have another shadow that is called config. And here we store some uh, settings for the, for the SNU. For example, uh, mobile user, the crib user, can open the app and there are some settings that he can set up. For example, the, the, the normal volume, like uh, it can be high, low or normal. Then uh, there are some modes like weaning, uh, suiting, responsiveness. We will not go deep into them, but just to show how we manage those settings. And, for example, user saves those settings. He has changed, for example, weaning, which was previously on. He puts, uh, puts it off. And for the responsiveness, uh, it was uh, normal and the user wants it to be high. Uh, how we manage this? If we would use just the MQTT protocol, and, for example, the crib is offline, user sets these settings, saves, but on the crib, nothing happens because the crib is not connected to the internet. This is the reason why we use the shadow. Uh, when the user saves the settings, those will be uh, saved in the config shadow in the desired state. Let's say that the reported state is like this. So the difference is between the winning and the responsiveness, as we can see in the delta. As soon as the device goes online, it will read the shadow, it will see the desired state, it will write to itself, then the reported state will become the same and the delta will be empty. 
So as we have discussed MQTT, IoT rules, and Shadow, it would be interesting to see how those three work together to uh, give us the ability to track the presence. Why the presence? Because AWS doesn't offer this out of the box, so we had to manage it by ourselves. It is important to have this information, uh, both for the end user, when he opens the app, he wants to see if the device is offline. Some of the commands should be disabled if the device is offline. And both for the customer care, maybe. The user has called the customer care, the, end, the agent then sees that his device is offline, he can ask him to turn on the device and etc. So how we manage presence tracking, but using those three. Uh, like we said, our snooze are connected to the IoT. And uh, out of the box, what AWS offers us are two MQTT topics. One is uh, events presence connected and events presence disconnected, uh, both end with the client ID, with the concrete client. As soon as the device goes online, a message will be sent to this topic. If the device disconnects, we will get message to this topic. There is some concept called last wheel of death. That means that the AWS managed this in the background with some, uh, it has constant communication with the device. And this is some kind of a life bit as soon as the live bit doesn't come from the device, it will send this message to the disconnected topic. This means that uh, if I turn off the device by using the button, it can set its state to the offline, which is not a problem. But maybe the power goes off, the device is disconnected, not by our will, not by our will but AWS will recognize this because the live bit is missing and the message will arrive to this topic. So we set up an IoT rule on this topic. We say, okay, we will set on events, presence, then we can use wildcard plus here. This means that with this, we cover both connected and disconnected case and slash here we also use wildcard, this means that we want to subscribe to all of the creeps. Uh, by the subject of the message, we can then uh, read whether the event is connected or disconnected, and we can read which creep has sent this message. Uh, we delegate this message to SQS, not to bother you what the SQS is, but uh, in simplest words, it is uh, like some simple queue where uh, when each message arrives, it will be served message by message in the order they have arrived. And from this SQS, we can uh, make some actions. For example, we can trigger some simple function, lambda, or we can make some another things. In our case, for the presence tracking, we will trigger the lambda. And the Lambda will do two things. One thing is to write the present status to the database. And the other thing is to write the present status to the IoT Shadow. So uh, the IoT Shadow is used for the customer, for the smartphone, so that the smartphone will, at any time, it can read the present status from it. On the other side, why do we write the presence info to the database? So it can be for two reasons. One reason is that uh, this way we can uh, track the history when the presence was online, when it was offline. And another thing is that when the customer care wants to see the present status, it will read from the database, not from the IoT shadow. The reason behind this is because uh, each operation in the IoT shadow has its price. With this, we lower these uh, costs. And also, uh, we, let's say, relax the network with the IoT Shadow so that we can use database for this operation. So with this, we are finished uh, with the communication part. And uh, for the end, we can maybe show how 
the creep works. Uh, there is a video here, but we will also try to simulate it in the real world. Okay, we can try also to start this one. You can see uh, the main screen on the app and the text here is small, but it says that the baby is calm. I will try to uh, trigger it with some noise. And you can see how the color on the screen is changed. Okay, you see now the color is purple because it goes one level up. We can also use manual commands here to control it. Now it goes one level up and so on. So, you may wonder why does it react on the music? So first of all, I mean, it's not generally idea to, to have music with the baby trying to sleep, so it, you shouldn't be worried about music triggering it. Uh, but anyway, with the next generation of Stu, we, we will also be able to uh, recognize whether the, the, this, let's say, loud voice is coming from the baby or from, the, from some, another external uh, resource. So that will be all from my side. If you have some questions, feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you have two sources yeah. of truth. So one that you have is your database, and another one is Amazon uh, Cloud Service that you are also using for data storage. So do I correctly understand that you have uh, two times more vulnerable system? Because once your database fall down or Amazon's one fall down, you lose some data and system becomes less operating. So. Uh, do I correctly understand that it makes system uh, kind of more vulnerable? Uh, so, uh, the important part there is that we use shadow, and the shadow is, let's say, the main source of truth. Uh, this means that uh, the, the user, the smartphone, only looks at the shadow. Uh, the database is used to store the history, and also to show uh, the real-time status to the customer care. If there is some problem with the database, for example, uh, the customer care can uh, read from the shadow. He can do this, the, the, just that the cost will be bigger. But let's say that uh, the normal flow for the customer care is to read from the database, but if something goes down on the database side, uh, he can always choose to read from the from the shadow. There is a, just a simple button to to check this. Uh, if I correctly understood you, then user, uh, which is not customer service but actual user yeah. like parent, uh, is mostly using uh, Amazon service, not your database. That's right. So um, and it is like a most popular use case because obviously a parent uses uh, it more often than the customer service. Mm -hmm. So do I correctly understand that most of the time you are storing data on site service and it is like a more common uh, use pattern? Uh, that is right. Yeah, yeah. We we store the data on the on the AWS side. Uh, we have some mechanisms to make this uh, data 
uh, both consistent and durable. So if something goes down, we also have, uh, let's say, mirrored uh, environments in the, in the, on the AWS uh, side. For example, the main region we use is uh, US East 1, but we also have the same things on the US West 1. So when the one region fails, which has happened in the, in the past, I think in 2018, AWS had this huge outage that the US East one was completely down, but every time uh, we have this, uh, let's say, uh, backup on the, on the US, West, West, yeah, uh, US West one, so that the user doesn't experience this outage. Uh, so my last question probably, uh, so you mean that uh, users, uh, client like mobile phone can communicate with your backend exactly if uh, Amazon services are down? They do communicate uh, with the backend, but uh, the use case is not when the AWS is down. Uh, so the mobile phone connects to the AWS, for example, uh, to um, all the commands that go to the, all the direct communication, direct communication with the crib goes through the AWS. That means I want to level up, I want to change some setting, I want to see uh, real time status of the uh, crib. On the other side, uh, we have our backend. We store there the users, and we also store, for example, the session history. This means that uh, if you want to look at the past 30 days, the sleep patterns and everything, for this case, uh, the mobile phone will uh, contact our backend, not the AWS, but our backend to get this data. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So. Something else. Mm -hmm. Hi, my question is, can I use this script without the internet at all? Can you repeat, sorry. Can I use this script without internet at all? I have two kids, twins, I have two crips and five mobile devices because they have the nannies, the fathers, the grandparents, yeah. and not all of them have all the time Wi-Fi. Yeah. What then? Uh, you can use it without internet uh, because the device is autonomous in the way that it listens to the baby, the level goes up, goes down, uh, the crib stops. There are also some safety clips here that uh, will prevent the crib moving without uh, these clips being attached. Everything this works autonomously. Uh, but if you would like to set some manual commands, for example, you can uh, level up with the buttons or maybe you can change some settings. Maybe you think that the baseline uh, sound is too loud. Maybe you cannot sleep because of it. So you can lower it down. For these things, you would need to have the app. For the basic functionality, it, for example, in the middle of the night, you, the internet goes down for some reason in your house, it will continue working. But you will not be able to see, uh, you will not be able to, to manipulate it with the, with the mobile phone. You can even change the level with the button. There is a mechanical button here, and if you want to go up or down with the level, you can use it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you for, yeah, there for, is a manual thing, that's okay. And yeah. one question is, do I need, really need to trust that all the sensors are giving you the right information and there is no really checkup if the real baby is crying or there is not a toy that it's making the, the noise or somebody is making a joke on me? Okay, so uh, at the moment, this generation of snow, uh, it will react on loud noises. There are some noises that, let's say, can imitate the baby sound and the snow will react on this. Uh, what happens in the backend, because we collect all this data, only if you uh, agree with this, and we analyze this data, then we will recognize that uh, this data doesn't come from the baby and we will not take it into account when we make some assumptions about the sleep patterns. Uh, why is it like this? Because uh, on the previous, on this current uh, generation of the SNU, uh, the computing power is not enough uh, to, to have some complex machine learning models that will separate the, 
the baby's cry from some other noises. This we can do on the backend side, but not in the real time. Uh, on the other side, a new generation of SNU, which should come up in the following months or years. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the computing power will be uh, higher and it will be able to, to do this. It will be also equipped with more sensors, like breath sensor, uh, movement sensors, uh, etc. Okay, and camera? I already have that with sensors with the temperature going on and moving baby with a camera and a baby phone without any IoT stuff. Just go and see your baby phone. Oh, he's sleeping. That's the toy behind that's making a noise, or he's just crawling around the, the crib. Ah, so I already have 10 years ago with the sensor blanket in all of it and a camera on top of it with that IoT. It's just the baby phone. Have you heard about that? Uh, no. No? Okay. So, all I mean, of this. You, you mean you, uh, can you there is that? already a baby blanket ah. that goes below. Uh -huh. And you have the sensor stuff there. Okay. And you have a camera. Okay. And whenever it happens, there is a sensor. Uh -huh. you, you okay. And you have a baby phone that has a camera. And you can always check the temperature mm -hmm. is up. And he's moving more mm -hmm. than usual and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you can decide if you want to get up or just okay. leave the baby sleeping. Okay, the, the difference here is that uh, this is not only sensor-based device, but it also makes some action. It, it will suit the baby with its movement. The, ba the basic idea with the crib is that it simulates uh, the womb sensations that the baby had when it was in the mother, and these womb sensations uh, trigger the calming reflex in the baby. Uh, the pediatrician, Dr. Harvey Karp, that uh, came up with this idea, he came up with this, I think, like 25 or 30 years ago. He wrote a book. Uh, there are like five principles behind this. And uh, he used this to calm babies with his hands and to uh, teach the parents how to do this. If you are a mommy, you all know that it's the uh, first class that you have, how you calm a baby, how you put it in the... That's known, okay. I've not read his book, but that's already known. But to be honest, okay, thank you. Okay. For me, too much IoT in the between. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, because uh, I, I guess a lot of IT people, when they hear about a new IoT uh, product, they are worried about uh, data collection and uh, about uh, what's your uh, data collection policy and uh, if a user requests for all, the, the, all their data that uh, you store on the database, can they um, basically get, get that uh, done? Uh, so basically, first of all, we have Let's just a bit talk about uh, the, this uh, consent and everything. Uh, since there are various parts here, users should give consent to each of them. Whether we can collect the sleep data, whether we can record the crying, etc. Another thing is that we also uh, worry about the GDPR. This means that the user data, for example, if the user comes from EU, the user data should be stored on the EU territory. And another thing is also the anonymization process. This means that if the user decides uh, that he do not want to have this uh, data kept on our site, he can uh, delete the user and we are obliged to delete all the data or to anonymize it in, in some way to, to, to separate it from the user so that the, any data that has left cannot be uh, traced back to the user. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you think that uh, current policies are good enough for uh, uh, that data anonymity in the U EU and the US regions? Uh, can you repeat uh, that? Because Sorry. you have to comply with those uh, mm -hmm. policies. Do you think they are good enough for uh, all IoT purposes? It's a hard, hard question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, hi. hi. Um, my question: um, Can uh, I, I know um, Amazon very expensive? Uh, can uh, end user pay not only for device but pay for subscribe uh, for use uh, as this device via internet? Uh, 
so if I understand the question, user pays for the crib, but uh, who pays for those expenses? Uh, uh, yes, Amazon very expensive. Yes, can and, and user pay not only for device, but uh, pay for uh, use this device uh, via Amazon, via internet. No, all those uh, expenses that are in the background are on our company. We pay by monthly rate, and the user only pays for the for the crib. That that's all. There are no additional possibilities for this. Uh, only one time, one time pay. Yeah, only yeah. for device. Only for device. Include. Yeah. He and he doesn't subscribe. He doesn't pay for the application. And I can use this device all all, all my life. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's true. Yeah, you can, but it's not really purposeful. I mean, what you can do is buy it and then rent it to someone. We cannot stop this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.